Talcott Parsons, a legend in sociology or a huckster trying to keep power in the hands of elites? Why does the theory of social stratification from a functionalist perspective assume that power is functional? Well, I'm the Economancer, the high priest of the Economicon, and it is my pleasure to share with you the sacred text of the Economicon. Today, I will help penetrate this idea by looking at Talcon, Talcott Parsons and explaining power and functionalism. By the end of this, I hope you come away with a better understanding of the subject. First, I want to talk about functionalism as defined by Parsons and how he associates uh, power differently, right? So Parsons doesn't assume that power is a zero-sum game. For him, power is derived from functionally important positions. A way of looking at this is like a CEO has more power than Jack, the forklift driver, because the CEO's role is indeed more functionally significant. And I'm sure many of you think that this does not make any sense because, well, without forklift drivers, logistics and manufacturing would stop. Yes, forklift drivers are an essential function. Still, you're mistaking a collective for an individual in importance. And in my example, it is just Jack. So obviously, the CEO is more functionally important. Therefore, he should functionally have more power. So this goes into how power is being allocated in the system. So power has been allocated to an individual to achieve some collective goal. First, the concentration of power creates a system that can facilitate cooperation through collective power without so many competing preferences that it implodes itself. Second, this concentration of power manifests reciprocity. You need not burn bridges, bridges to move forward with your plan of action, which, which necessitates you compromising with others. So pardon, Parsons did not assume that power is a matter of social coercion and domination. Now, this is something echoed by Jordan Peterson, this sentiment, when he describes competence hierarchies versus you know power hierarchies so let us think about like what is social coercion and, and domination and does it exist in our current system well social coercion is society telling you that you ought to behave a certain way because it's what society wants and then domination is where you have individuals with power who hold it over you to make you act or do something in a certain way. Um, now, when we move into critical theory, we get to the idea that this isn't, um, this isn't a, an objective reality. This is something subjective that individuals feel, and it's through the structure of society that this comes about. We've, we've briefly touched on this, but that's kind of the thing, and he's, he's rejecting that. Now, uh, so can there be social coercion and domination within the system that Pars Parsons is laying out? Absolutely. And the second question is, is this a function only of a top-down stratification? Now, in my opinion, there is no evidence that domination, authoritarianism, or totalitarianism comes from only elites. Many movements come from a place of oppression, and when we look at this oppression, we can say that it's a, a, a subjective belief. So this subculture or class doesn't necessarily need to be empirically justified in its feelings of oppression. A better way to look at this is the Germans before World War II. They saw the Jews as an oppressor class. And there are numerous other examples uh, in history. There's the Malaysians um, in the 1930s and 40s with Chinese, um, even later. You know, all of these things where, you know, the in-group or the majority group feels like the minority is oppressing them because they managed to take hold in whatever uh, endeavor that they're doing. So, what is power then? Well, power is essentially a transferring property. So, we can think of it as an energy storage problem. The person higher in the hierarchy converts energy from this complex ethereal form to a more convenient output. An example is like taxation. The collective wants to distribute some amount of money more evenly so those that are struggling will tend to struggle less. The energy of the struggle and the want to redistribute resources are stored in public sentiment and then this moves through the academics, 
policy wonks, and eventually manifests itself in politicians. As that level of energy in the system grows, at some point in time, it becomes sufficient to change the system. We see that politicians are voted into office, and the overall taste for redistribution or social welfare is increased and acted on. So you could think of a politician as a battery. All the energy was coursing through the system and became stored. And once enough is held in, it can start the car. So this explains how power in the system is functional, as it is how humans allocate resources to accomplish collective goals. This coordination effort of society is referred to as a second best outcome, because First best is utopia, and utopia is a fallacy and will never exist. So, functionalism leads to the idea that power resides in society as a whole, not in a monopoly or an oligarchy or an oligopoly. There are plenty of criticisms of this model, but let us think about it for a moment. Assume that there are no bad actors at the top of the hierarchy and no exogenous influences on the top's incentives. We could say for sure that this matches reality as the theory would prove mostly true under a diverse set of conditions. The problem is that there are bad actors at the top and exogenous influences on the incentives of the top. So obviously this leads to imply that the blame should fall on those at the top, right? Maybe. But why do we assume that those at the top are nefarious where those at the bottom are virtuous? Because from my point of view, there is no evidence that confirms this hypothesis that whoever is higher in whatever hierarchy is less morally upstanding person than those at the bottom. And that this hypothesis is firmly related to this neo-Marxist postmodern conflict theory. However, the problem is that there is no empirical evidence that shows those at the top are worse. So it's hard for me to just flat out buy this argument without, you know, any empirical investigation into it. And this is kind of the idea of why Parsons pushed this functionalism, this structural functionalism, and why we needed to uh, invigorate sociology in many of the humanities. Uh, there's, there's many that went into other forms of the humanities, like I'll give an example, Hayek uh, in cliometry, uh, which is the economic study of history or the study of economic history uh, he pointed out that a lot of it was done through a Marxist lens and that you know this lack of capitalist lens hurts the discipline and so he he formulated ideas that would lead to cliometry to be more you know classically liberal in its viewpoints and so Parsons kind of taking this whole idea as well like okay we need to integrate these social sciences under the sciences and again this leads back into the econometrics and, and basically the whole methodology that we've evolved um, from science into the social science. Um, it's less of an issue in places like economics, and that's because economics had its empirical or the in, uh, the empiricism revolution from Stigler, Friedman, and stuff like that, as well as the fathers of econometrics and, and wanting to actually test these structures, plus a, a, a large swath of the individuals within it, um, they came from I guess you could say fairly conservative backgrounds and because it's a younger science um it's kind of kept on to that that doesn't mean that it's true now um there's a lot of discussion going on on how to integrate uh postmodern theories into econometrics anyway i digress so this was this was the idea that parsons was trying to work with in this that we have a society, it functions as a way to set up the importance of tasks for competence for whatever reason you may point at. Now, why does this fall out of favor? We've gone into this a little bit, but another thing to think about is that there's a growing amount of literature in, in economics focusing on anti-corruption policies. So, Anti-corruption assumes, or corruption studies in general, assumes a very strong relationship between the 1% or the 10% and the influence that they have over the political realm. Now, this is something we're going to get into with Lipset after the fact. I think the next one we're going to get into is going to be Schumpeter and his ideas on social classes um, as well as economic classes. Because th this 
leads in more into the argument that Parsons was getting at because Parsons' best friend and the person he considered the best economist at the time was Schumpeter. He uh, he wrote quite frequently, um, to, in, in, I shouldn't say in attack of neoclassical, but he did. He, cr he criticized, you know, Milton Friedman and the others along the lines of their presuppositions he didn't disagree with them in their methodology, but he did in their presuppositions of homo economicus and stuff like that. And it's all about Weber. So it's all of this is derived from Weber. And so as we get deeper into it, we may go back a step and look more into Weber. But the next one is going to be Schumpeter. And then we're going to Lipset. And then we might go back to Weber. And then we'll move into postmodernism. Anyway. I'm the Economancer. I hope you've learned something and have a wonderful day.